welcome again to our prayer time and Bible study for the uh, family of Good Shepherd Baptist Church. Again, for all of you that are viewing on today, listening on today, for those of our friends and family uh, that encourage us by listening, we're certainly grateful and thankful to you for uh, allowing us the opportunity to share with you the, uh, the Word of God. I want to encourage us to remain encouraged uh, as a church. We know that our desires of many is that we reopen our worship and the like. Uh, it's, not, it's not our time yet. Uh, we know that eventually that time is going to come, but it's not our time yet. And so we just ask that we continue praying for each other and uh, continue praying for your, your elders, for your pastors uh, who are having to make these uh, decisions concerning, again, your, your actually for your own well-being. Uh, so would that you would keep them in prayer. Shall we pause for just a moment and talk to God? Uh, and uh, we will move further in our study for this day. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we are grateful and thankful to you for the blessing of life. Thank you, Lord, for knowing that that life is centered and circumferenced in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for Jesus. We thank you, God, for the fact that you allowed him to live in a world. You allowed uh, him to die for our sins. You allowed him to be buried in a grave, you allowed him to rise for our best vindication. You allowed him to ascend back on your right hand, and right now he is making intercession for us. We thank you, God, that he sent the Holy Spirit who abides and resides in us and helps us to understand your mind, helps us to understand your word. And so we are grateful, we are humbled by the fact that the mere reality of knowing what you say, we can understand it. We know it's only because... You've given us your Holy Spirit to live and abide in us, and for that we're very grateful. Father, every time we stand in this setting on Wednesday mornings, it's always mindful of people who are going through seasons of difficulty and disease and sickness and even death. And so this morning we do pray for Jocelyn, Victoria. We pray for Katrina Sauls. We pray for them, Lord, as they are making preparations to travel and to go and bury a sister and an aunt. Respectively, we ask, Lord, that you would grant peace to them. Uh, you know Katrina's heart, Father, and you know her concerns. Uh, you know her desires. You know, again, her emotions. You know her thoughts. You know her fears. And I pray, God, that you would give comfort to her heart and uh, help her to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you're God, you're good, and you will, you will sustain her. You will keep her just as you've done uh, throughout all of the tragedies and the difficulties of life that you've allowed her to experience within these last couple of years. So I pray again for her and lift her up and ask again your grace and your mercy be upon her. God, we pray for the family of uh, a great stalwart pastor preacher, uh, Dr. Manson Johnson. We pray for that family and lift them before you. Uh, and ask again your peace, Lord, for comfort as only you can give and help them to know uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt that there are, there are people of God, there are followers of Jesus Christ who are praying for them and, and praying again for their peace and for their comfort. And I just ask, Lord, again, that you would allow them to live in that reality and to sense that reality. Lord, but we do mourn with them. We, 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 we grieve with them. We, ex we experience the same sorrow uh, to the extent that we possibly can as they are. And so we, we certainly live them before you, God, and ask again that you would just have mercy and give them strength in this, in this hour. We pray again for the family of Reverend Hel Henry Eldridge, uh, for Hope's dad. We pray for his sisters. Uh, we pray for his brother, God. And I just pray again you continue to bless all of them in the need they stand, God. As they get old in age and life is getting a little bit more difficult. But we know you're gracious. We know you have all power. And we know you can do all things. And so we entrust them to you and ask again your perfect will be done in each of their lives. Uh, Father, I pray for this Myra Bailey, a uh, um, great friend of ours, a great friend of the Edwards, a neighbor of the Edwards, and I just pray you continue to keep her, Lord. You know what she is going through and know what experience of life that she is currently dealing with, but God, we know that you're great, and we know you got all power, so we would still ask a day for healing because we know you still can do that, Lord, and so whatever way you choose to do it, we pray again, your perfect will be done. 
Father and God, again, we do, we do live before you, our own Reverend Linton Jason, and thank you for what you're doing in his life and allowing him to recover from the, sur- from the stroke sorry, that he had and to know that he's getting better every day, God, still rejoicing in you, still loving you, still um, enjoying his quartet music and all the other music that he loves to hear, uh, still praising you even through the midst of his problem. And so we thank you, God, uh, for him. We pray again, Lord, I pray for my, my, uh, my sister. Um, I, I pray again that you would bless Dana Mitchell in the need that she stands. God, you know what she is experiencing now. And I ask God that you would comfort her heart as only you are able to do. Help her to know that you made a promise. You would never leave her, nor would you ever forsake her. And that you will be with her in her tears. You will be with her uh, in her moments of sorrow. You will be with Erica. You will be with Blake. We ask again, you continue to bless them, Father, in the need of which they stand. Uh, and then again, we know what's going on in our world. We pray again for you to allow the doctors, uh, the scientists to find a cure uh, for this coronavirus, for the COVID-19. We know it's still affecting our world in various ways. People are still dying, Lord, uh, recently what we've heard. And so we we just pray again that you would... Uh, provide the cure that's necessary, provide the cure that's needed, provide the vaccine that's needed to be able uh, to allow us to move on to that quality of life where that we're not, we're not, we're not having to do as much social distancing. We're, we're able to return to our various places of worship. We're able to return to work. We're able uh, to visit one another without, without, without any, any fear of of getting sick and getting ill, Lord, and concerns about getting sick and getting ill. So we ask again that you would do it, Lord. We we pray again, uh, knowing that you're God and you can do whatever you choose to do. We'll never demand it, but we shall know how to ask it, and we ask it in Jesus' name. And then, Lord, for the unrest of our world, we know the protests that are going on, and God, we do pray for the family of uh, George Floyd. We, we, um, oh God, we ask again that you would give comfort as only you are able to do, Father, to think that uh, every day they are re, re experiencing that 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 awful event that took place, and I pray, I pray for them moving forward, Lord, uh, uh, because of because of media, they're going to always be exposed to it, and so I pray for them as they go through their pain. I pray for his daughter uh, that we uh, were able to be exposed to on yesterday, God, that you would. Uh, uh, some way, somehow, comfort her heart, whoever it may be, her mom or whoever you may give to give comfort and peace to her, to some, some understanding in, in terms of what's going on. So, so, Lord, at the end of the day, we know our greater concern is for that family. We pray for that family. They are the ones that are having to experience the fact that there's another a loved one that is, that is gone. Uh, but we do know in light of it, there's a lot of pain in our country. There's a lot of pain in our world. And, God, we ask uh, that you will allow all entities that be, the church, the government, society at large, all of us, God, help us to do our part. Help us to, um, to be kind, to be considerate, um, uh, to recognize that uh, justice will prevail. We, we're, we're convinced of that. It will prevail. Um, and we, we, we live with the reality. Sometimes it doesn't in this lifetime, but, but we know nothing is going unnoticed by you. Uh, you told us not to fret over evildoers because vengeance is yours, said the Lord, and you will repay. And so we, we, we rest in that. We relax in that. We rely on that uh, because you're the only one who knows how to uh, suspend. You're the only one who knows how to expend. You know, the only one who knows how to give proper judgment, proper justice uh, to the extent that it's the conclusion of the matter. So we entrust all these things to you. And we pray now that you will be with us as we um, pause for a moment just to uh, take some time to study the issue of social justice and to see how you would respond, have us respond to it on the basis of your word. Open our hearts, open our minds, give us clarity, uh, help us to see what you want us to see, say what you want us to say, so that at the end of the day, the glory will be yours. Hopefully, again, the, glo- the growth will be ours. We ask these things in Christ's name and his name alone we pray. Amen. 
Uh, for those of you that have already been exposed to the, uh, the handout, I would that you would uh, just observe that for the, uh, the moments that we have on today. I thought it was important just for a while today at least to address uh, the, uh, the issue, to say something about it as it relates to social justice. I uh, didn't get, really get a chance on last week or even on uh, Sunday to, uh, to deal with it, I guess, uh, from, a, from a, a Bible study perspective. But I think it's important to uh, spend a little time today reflecting on it and to look at it from the perspective in terms of God's word on social justice and, of course, uh, we recognize the issue of the injustice. So I'm going to the handout. Again, this is redundant. This is reading uh, that, that you're looking at. You can read it for yourself. But if you would indulge me, uh, just allow me to, uh, to read along with you or you read along with me. And then we can unpack some of the things uh, that I believe that the Lord has given me uh, to, uh, to share with us. Uh, the word social uh, is of or related to human society. Uh, the end of action of the individual and the group or the welfare of human beings as members of society. So doesn't matter where we go, we see, we see society. We see uh, social gatherings. We see that, that it represents a group of people uh, who come together, who interact on different levels, whether it's on a job, whether it's for play, uh, whether it's for, um, um, uh, for talking, uh, whatever that whatever that may be, that's an interaction that goes on with human beings. And so, therefore, we're just looking, again, just the basic meaning of the word social. The word justice is the administration of law, especially the establishment or determination of rights according to the rules of law or equity. That's the basic definition. Again, all of these definitions we're looking at are from uh, Merriam-Webster's 10th edition. Uh, the word injustice would be the opposite of justice in the absence of justice, a violation of right or of the rights of another. Uh, synonymous terms would be injustice, injury, wrong, grievance. Uh, all of this mean an act that inflicts undeserved hurt. Injustice applies to any act that involves unfairness to another or violation of their rights. Yeah, and so uh, what we clearly understand is that all of us are part of society. All of us are part of what we call a, a social establishment. And within that establishment, and it doesn't matter how we gather together as far as a society is concerned, uh, within that establishment, there are laws that are given. There are, there are rules that are given. There are commandments that are given. There are regulations, uh, regulations that are given. And, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter on the group. If it can, a, a family is in a society and a family has rules. Um, uh, a job is part of society and a job has rules. A team is part of society and a team has rules. An organization is part of society, and an organization has rules. There are things that are established or determined as to what is right and what is wrong. Even gangs, who can be violent gangs, they have justice or, if you would, rules within their society that determine how they are to operate within their their gang. So we're, we're always experiencing it. We're always some sort of way in society. We're always some sort of way having some social uh, interaction. Um, um, and there are, there are some people, you know, to be honest right now, there are some people who are doing very well with uh, uh, social distancing. People are doing well. I don't, I don't need to be around people. That's, that's what some people are saying. However, God didn't make us. He didn't, he didn't make us that way. He made us to be part of society. He made us to be part of a social uh, interaction whereby there is human exchange of information, human exchange of emotion, uh, human exchange of, of, of uh, ideas and, and concepts and the like. And that's how God made us. Uh, when you think of God himself, we, we think uh, the Father, the Son, the Holy, Holy Spirit. There is a, a social interaction within the Trinity itself uh, as relates to God. And so uh, what we want to look at today, 
the, uh, I guess the, uh, the fourth uh, paragraph. Based on the scriptures, the first act of social justice, or in actually an injustice, was between Cain and Abel. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. Anytime you go to the book of Genesis, you always see Genesis as the book of beginnings. It is the origin of creation as we know it. Um, and it's the origin of anything that we know, anything that exists, we can find it in Genesis. Technology, we can find it. Science, we can find it. Anthropology, we can, doesn't matter. Anything that we know on a human level actually has its origin in the book of Genesis. I know somebody's saying, oh, I can think of something. I, there's nothing you can think of that you can't find it in the book of Genesis. It may not say it the exact same way you say it, but you can find it right there. So let's do this. Uh, just again for our edification. It says, now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. And then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the first fruit of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. And he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? Why, why if, if, you, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And his desire is for you but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now, you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, vagabond, I'm sorry, you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely, you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen to anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Wow. All right. So let's just kind of work through that again, going back to the handout. Society. Let's, let's look at it socially. What do we see socially with these? With the, they, they were brothers in a family. It started off with, with, with Adam and Eve. And so now there are two brothers in a family. There are people in, four people in the family. They are brothers in a family. That's society. They had meaningful jobs. One was a tiller of the ground, a farmer. Uh, another was, uh, you would say, a keeper of sheep. They had, they had the practice of giving offerings to the Lord. We see that uh, in verse 3. Uh, Cain brought an offering of the first fruit of the ground. Also, uh, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. Now, again, they're in a society, they're in a family, and so they have an inter- action with each other that watch this that that that's an agreeable thing they they are all doing the same thing they're both they're both males they're both brothers they're sons if you will uh they work they 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 give offerings to god but notice now it moves from justice if you would i'm sorry socially but then we also see now that the lord administered justice, when did he do that? When he, is, when he respected Abel's offering, but he did not respect Cain's offering. Go back to that definition of, of justice on, on, on the handout. The administration of law, especially the establishment or determination of rights according to the rules of law or equity. 
All right? So now they both had the responsibility to offer to God. Uh, one chose to offer to God what God wanted. Another chose to offer to God what he wanted God to have. And according to the scripture, we see that God administered that justice. And as a result of that, we also see injustice. Injustice was, injustice was committed when Cain talked with, rose up, and killed his brother Abel. Yeah, first, first, the first murder, the first, the first time we see um, bloodshed is in the Bible. It's in the Word of God, uh, and 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 so now that's injustice because remember they're part of a society. There are some agree agreeable forms that they live according to, and it's apparently these forms had been established by God. But what happens? You've got Cain who violates the norms of that society. He, he violates the, the justice, if you would, of that society, and he does what? He kills his brother. I often hear people say that uh, when uh, uh, at funerals people say, you know, if a child uh, dies and the parents are burying the child, they say, you know, it's not supposed to be like that. That's just, that's not the way it's supposed to go. You know, but 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 listen, let's go to the word of God. The word of God is teaching us that the first the first murder was done by a brother against his brother. Uh, the first the first uh, funeral was uh, in a sense, you say, was attended by my parents. Um, and so and so what it shows us that that the the decision of Adam to eat from the tree that God had said not to eat from has all kinds of ramifications. It, it brings forth all kinds of evil. It, it just brings forth all kinds of mischief and, 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 and wickedness and, and things that, 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 that hurt, that, that cause pain. And so notice now, when God has now, he has to administer justice. The Lord administered justice. That's the last sentence in the, in the, in the fourth paragraph. The Lord administered justice because of Cain's injustice. Why? In violating the social well-being of Abel that was obviously established, and I actually should have put it again, by the Lord. So he does two things. He violates the Lord's standards, social, social, social norms. He, he violated the Lord's standard of justice that God had already put in place, but then he also violated the well-being of his brother because society is actually made together for us to take care of one another, for us to support one another, for us to see about one another, for us to care for one another. But we see right there in the Bible, and listen, every time we violate the justice of God, every time we violate a law that has been given to us by the Lord, we are literally repeating what Cain did. Now watch this. When God administered that justice to Cain, he didn't like it. He was upset. He was angry. He said, oh Lord, my punishment is just too strong because understand this, that God, the fact that he, he lays out a law, God always wants us to be understood that his law, whether it's obeyed, or disobeyed doesn't just stay in neutral, brothers and sisters. Let's understand that. It doesn't stay in neutral. It doesn't, it doesn't stay in neutral. In other words, what God is saying, that there are rewards for obeying that law, but then there are also consequences, if you will. There are penalties for disobeying that law. We can be, God is going to deal with us. That's what the scripture teaches us. God is going to deal with us. And he has, he has different ways of dealing with us. But you remember, his, his, his justice is motivated by his love. What God, what God does not allow is someone that he created. I want y'all to just think about, just think about the home you live in. Think about the home you live in. You know, whether, whether you are, you know, you were growing up, the sister and a brother. I mean, you know, parents had certain rules in the house. and there were certain things you could and could not do, you know. And so the reality was that whenever you violated whatever those rules were, uh, the truth is that those rules that you violated 
had the consequences had to be dealt with. I mean, sometimes they were good, sometimes they were bad. You know, Sian and I got in trouble a whole lot at the house at the uh, the Skinner's address, man, because we would violate we would violate uh, Elvin and Lucille's laws. We would ooh wait. Um, Charlene did pretty good. Charlene Charlene was pretty obedient. She yeah she would she listened. Um, um, yeah, Sian and I were not as uh, we were not as respectable as we should have been. Let's just put it that way. So, but we had to face what the consequences of our decisions. And so now he, 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 God has to administer his law, and, and, and Cain is upset with it. Isn't it amazing that, that how we've, we've gotten up, we get upset with a policeman because he, he stops us for the fact we were speeding? That, isn't that something? We've actually been speeding, and we're upset because they stopped us. Isn't that special? But isn't that again? It's a product of showing what sins brings on is that it tends to help us believe that I can operate independent of whatever the law may be. But understand, anytime I violate God's law, there's always going to be consequences. Look at the next thing. It says, when God established Israel as a nation, he gave them laws for their social interactions. The justice of the Lord was to be applied to everyone equally without exception. The following were given to citizens, officers, and to judges. If you would go back next book over to Exodus, the book of Exodus chapter 21. I just want to show you an, an example there. And of course, I do know what somebody's already saying, but that's the Old Testament Lee uh, pastor. Uh, well, here's what the, Bi the Bible actually teaches us, that th those things that were written before are written for us as examples. And what I'm looking at is to see it as a pattern of obedience, that it doesn't matter uh, uh, where we are, the laws that we have, the laws that we live by, are ultimately established by God. Uh, they, they originate from God. They come from God. They can't come from any other source. It has to come from God. There are certain laws that have been made that aren't good laws, but they are actually opposite laws of what God God intended. So every law, doesn't matter how you look at it, ultimately it comes from the very mind of God. So we look at again at Deuteronomy chapter 21, pick it up at verse 12. We're not going to look at all of these, we're just going to, just, just a few on to, uh, notice what the verse 12, and this is, this is, this is, this is um, at home with us right now. Notice what the scripture says, he who strikes a man so that he dies so surely be put to death. That's that, that was God's way of dealing with Israel. That, that was his. That's, that's, those are the laws that he established for Israel. Now watch this. However, now it sounds like an exception, but watch this. It's an exception based upon God's law. It's not an exception based upon man making it an exception. It's an exception based upon what God says. Now, however, if he did not lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hand, then God says, I will appoint for you a place where you may flee. Uh, the Bible talks about cities of refuge, that if a person killed a person, sometimes it was accidentally or uh, in self-defense, but the family didn't know it was in self-defense. That was a place that they could run, a city of refuge, and they had to stay there as long as a particular high priest was in order and all of that. And those are some things that you look at a little bit later on in Scripture. Uh, and he who, notice again, here's, here's some, some strong language. He who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He who, keeps a, who kidnaps a man and sells him or is found uh, in his hand shall surely be put to death. He who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Lord have mercy. I tell you, if that was still a law today that we live by, the whole, be a whole lot of folk dead, y'all. Let's just be very honest, because uh, we, are, we are literally in a loyalist society sometimes where people dishonor, disrespect, uh, don't value their parents, say anything they want to say to them. And listen, it doesn't have to necessarily be a profound word. Sometimes it's just the way you can say it to a parent that God would have said that person at that time was deserving of death. Um, another one, just another example of that. If men contend with each other and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist and he does not die but is confined to a bed, watch this, if he rises again, 
and walks about outside with a staff, then he who struck him shall be acquitted. He shall only play for the loss of his time. Again, you know how we hear that most of the time, but we hear that word in lawsuits. Or we hear that in a settlement. What I'm saying is, is that doesn't matter where we go, doesn't matter what we do, God has already given us some direction and example in terms of how that ought to really be applied in his word. Um, and shall provide for him uh, uh, to be thoroughly healed. Again, yeah, that's, that's taking care of that individual because of, uh, of what, was, uh, what was done. Look at verse uh, 22. To me, that's an interesting one. If, a may, if men fight and hurt a woman with a child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished according to as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life. Watch this. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. All God was saying is that in, in terms of the nation of Israel, what he was, was demonstrating was the value of life, the importance of life. And if you did something, if I did something to you, what God was saying, the retribution for what me did, for what I did to you, was equal to what I had done. And so, so, so if I, I, again, if I did something and I, and I caused your, you, the inability to see Basically, if it was your right eye, the law would say, I had to lose my right eye. Because the goal was, God was not showing that he was mean. What God was pointing out to the people is the value of life. I created you. You created in my image, after my likeness. And what God is saying, do not devalue human life. Listen, folks. So many times we devalue human life has nothing to do, nothing to do, nothing to do with a knee on the neck, nothing at all. We devalue human life sometimes. We just look at people and we decide they're ugly. We look at people and decide we don't care anything about them. We look at them and just decide I don't like them. That's devaluing the life that, and that is the point that God is making in all of these judgments that he would give them, as he would say in, uh, in, in chapter 21, verse 1. Now, these are the judgments which you shall set before them. In other words, God has decided this is the way I want you to interact with each other in society. And so, and so the reality, I think, for all of us, even when we look, experience what we're experiencing now, it's, it's a time for a gut check for all of us. How are we devaluing other people? How, how are we devaluing other races? How are we devaluing other genders? How are we devaluing people sometimes from economic perspectives that may not have as much as we have? Do we value them highly? Do we esteem them highly, as scriptures say? Or do we demonstrate injustice oh yeah it's 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 obvious what we saw what we saw a week ago monday that was obvious injustice we don't that's not even open that's not even open for debate not even open for any kind of wondering whether or not it would no that was injustice in its highest form however we got to be careful about our own little slick injustices. Yeah, those little things that we do under our breath, things that we say, certain ways that we, that we look at people. You ever think about the word prejudice? You know, you know the word that you get in, in a hurry is prejudge, prejudge. I have to admit, I have to admit, I have to admit I'm a human being, and, 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 and I got hints of prejudice in me. But I'm always having to check that with the Holy Spirit and to make a determination that I don't prejudge a person unless I really know what I'm talking about, until I know what I'm talking about. Because I have to be careful to make sure that even within my own self, that I don't devalue a person that was created by God. So he's, he's, given, he's laying it out socially, uh, what we're to do, how we are to... Uh, to respond. Go to, go to Exodus 23 right quick. Exodus 23, a couple of chapters over. Exodus 23. Look at verse, pick it up at verse 9. Exodus 20, I'm sorry, verse 1. 
He says, you shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. I love this in verse 2. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. You shall, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. You shall not show partiality to a poor man in a dispute. If you meet a, no, no, let me, let me go to verse 6. He says, you shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in a dispute. Keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. You shall not take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. Also, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, because he would say to Israel, you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So you ought to know what that feels like. Why are you going to hurt somebody when you have had the experience, Israel, of somebody hurting you? Let's go to Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16. In Deuteronomy 16, he is actually speaking to those who are the judges, those who are the officers. Deuteronomy 16, look at verse 18. He says, you shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates, which the Lord your God gives you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. And I think that's one of the things that we're dealing with right now. We are saying to the governmental officials, no longer show partiality to, to, to law enforcement officers who are breaking the law. They are just as responsible to uphold the law. So don't show partiality. Don't show partiality. Um, nor take a bribe. For bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You shall follow what is altogether just, that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Wow, this is, this is, this is great instruction for us. Going back to the handout, going back to the handout. In the New Testament, God gave the church of Jesus Christ commandments relative to one another, society, and government. In light of our current events, the entire epistle of 1 Peter is a most dependable resource. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, and many of us know that passage already. Uh, listen, we are, we, are, we, are not, we are not a Christian nation. The United States is not a Christian nation. Uh, we happen to be Christians who live in the nation of the United States, but the United States in and of itself is not a Christian nation. Um, um, uh, it's not a Christian nation. Now watch this. But here's what he says, within the citizenship of the United States of America, there are us, those of us, who are a nation unto God, which is important. Notice what he reminds us in, 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 in um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, I love that word, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now... <coughs> have obtained mercy. So what he's saying to us, that within the nation of the United States of America, we, the people of God, are a nation unto God. Uh, Philippians would remind us that our citizenship is not here. Our citizenship is in heaven. And listen, th this is what I'm talking about. It's for those of us who are believers. It's for those of us who have put our trust, our faith, our confidence in Jesus Christ as our personal sin bearer, those who've been redeemed, those, again, whose sins have been forgiven, those of us who have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit, where we're no longer dominated and controlled by sin. This is for us. 
it's not, it's not for your family member that doesn't know Jesus. It's not for the natural man that doesn't know the things of God. These are for us who are believers and followers of Jesus Christ. So what he is saying, that there is a proper representation that God expects us to have. Why? Because we are the nation. We are the holy priesthood that represents him. We are his own special people. Don't you think it's cool to be known as special people to God? Wow. And what are we to do? We're to proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Ah, huh, wow. You know, I, um, I have to be honest, and, and the, uh, the Lord just giving me this right now. And I'm, and I'm saying this to some folk in, in, in mainly the Good Shepherd Church. You know, uh, um, I, there are a lot of marches and protests and the like that's going on right now. Uh, we, we, uh, we, have a, we have a march that starts from here every Saturday before the first Sunday. Every Saturday before the first Sunday, we got a march. And... And we're actually going out. We're actually protesting against sin, but we're actually proclaiming the name of Jesus. So I want to invite y'all, you know, uh, when, we, when, we, when we can get back to some uh, uh, opportunities to knock on doors <laughs> and that sort of thing, I want to invite y'all to come out to the protest against sin and the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ as we go throughout city gas, walking on the streets hand in hand. Plackers in our hand, we call them, we call them uh, tracks, um, holding the Bible up, but we holding it up for a real purpose, and uh, we want to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. So, so that's who we are. That's what we represent, and so God has given us socially, uh, he's given us the just commands that he has for us, and he's helping us to understand that even within us as believers, we can commit injustice against one another. And so there are just certain things that he would say. And then he reminds us in, 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 in of course, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. Uh, this is what, this is our mantra right now, definitely, while we're going through what we're going through. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and do what? Honor the king. That's the command that God has given to us as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know some folk totally disagree with that, but I'm saying to you, your battle is not with Lee Skinner. I promise you, your battle is with the Lord because he has not adjusted, he has not changed his commands during the pandemic nor in the protest for any of us. So he's given us his word and he's laid it out for us. Uh, here's another thing. Uh, the letter the letter written by James uh, deals with prejudice. Matter of fact, just turn to James right quick. That's the, the book, the, the, the letter right before uh, uh, First Peter. Get James. James tells, J James chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. He says, for whoever shall keep the law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you commit adultery, but you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will, is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs, he would say is, over judgment. And so we're reminded again in the word of God, that's the way that God wants us to apply his word. I'm sorry, let me look at, go back at verse 8. It says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. Wow. It's the royal law. Because remember, we are a royal priesthood. We are a holy, we are a holy nation. We are chosen with special people to God. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. Whoever shall keep the law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. So God is saying, this is a time that we got to show love to our neighbor. And who is my neighbor? Basically, anybody that he lets me come in contact with, I'm talking about as a believer. He's talking about the fact that even in this situation, we got to be careful how in, so in, in, in society, we got to be careful how we deal with our tongue. Look at chapter 3. Look at chapter 3. Look at verse 8 through 10 again. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an un un unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless God our Father, and with it we curse men who has been made in the similitude of God. Don't miss that, y'all. With it we bless God, we bless our God and Father, and with it we, we, curse, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth, Proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. 
Oh, my goodness. Can't say amen, say ouch, 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 ouch. And then he, he helps us to understand, even in the, in the midst of what we're going through, be careful about our own infighting. Be careful about our own infighting. Uh, because we are, so the church is a society, even amongst itself. The church now goes to uh, out in the marketplace. The church now goes to the neighbors in the neighborhood. The church goes to meetings, all of these kinds of things. So he reminds us, just looking at, at, at chapter 4, and I won't, I, won't look at, I won't read all of these verses, but just a, a couple of them. James, where do wars and, and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your own desire for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Now, notice again, James is writing this. He is writing this to believers. He is writing this to first century believers, followers of Jesus Christ. These are some people who more than likely saw Jesus. They could have actually witnessed the life of Jesus when he was physically here on the planet. And he is saying that within us, there are wars that are going up. And brothers, this is my encouragement. In the midst of all of the fervor and everything that's going on, don't allow what's going on on the outside to cause you to be so upset that, 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 that you begin to act uh, like those who have no Holy Spirit. Remember I told you all um, uh, last week uh, when the first protest was coming, I sent one admonition to you all, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, 27. He says, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. That's still the admonition. What we saw a week ago Monday, we ought to be angry at it, no doubt about it. However, God is still saying to us, there's a way he expects us to act within, again, this society that we're living in. I'm just getting ready to wrap it up. Here's the, the final paragraph. The following scriptures, like so many others, uh, I should have said the previous scriptures, I'm sorry. Like so many others, teach us the responsibility we have for all people. Therefore, we should read, study, and apply the word of God for a proper response to social justice and injustice. As Christians who live in America, we have been given the right to vote. This is, this is, this is Lee Skinner now. I just want to let you all understand that. I can't Because I can't find voting in the Bible, so this is Lee Skinner. Change is possible, but we must become more educated, active voters in our local elections of judges, district attorneys, sheriffs, and constables. People in law enforcement must uphold the law and be held accountable. As citizens, we must be law-abiding and held accountable too. And the reason I say that is because we know. Everybody, everybody is kind of already talking about it. You know, we're already hearing it in news media and the like. Uh, the, uh, the 2020 elections are coming up. It's the presidential election. So everybody's going to be ready. Everybody's talking about voter registration, getting ready to vote. Listen, we live in America. And the reality is that the popular vote has already been proven. It was proven to us three years ago, literally four years ago, that the popular vote is not who gets the president in. Let's just be very honest with that. We're in America. It's called the Electoral College, right? So be that as it may, unless we can all come together and change that, write petitions, whatever, our congressman, our senate, and all of that, unless we can get that changed, that's our reality. However, you know, when, when those um, uh, elections come up for constable and sheriff and, and uh, uh, judges uh, in our various precincts and judges in our courts, when those issues come up, those are the persons that can really help us to make changes. The kind of change that we need, that, that needs to be done in terms of what happened uh, to, uh, to Mr. Floyd, it's on that level that all of us have the potential to cause change to take place. Now, folk, we can be mad, angry, upset, protest, Unfortunately, people burning up stuff, tearing up stuff, tearing up buildings, which, which is totally ridiculous, which makes no sense whatsoever. Should not be condoned. No one should be saying it's okay to no degree because we're talking about individual people's properties who are being destroyed. We're talking about places where 
mothers, single mothers go to that job to be able to take care of her children. But because that building is burned and no longer functional, that mom now can't go to work. Nothing, nothing, there's nothing redeeming about that factor at all. But, but when all of this fervor is done, and when all of the, the, uh, the anger is uh, starting to quell, I'm saying to us, we have the potential to make change, but we're going to have to be educated. We're going to have to still trust what the word of God uh, to understand how is it possible we can look at all of this injustice and we are part of the church of Jesus Christ, which is the most powerful entity in the universe. How is it we can still have all of these and we've got so many people who claim to be Christians? Well, guess what? It's an indication that Christians need to vote. We need to exercise our power to vote. But we need to vote for those changes that happen on the local level so that those kinds of things that we see. Uh, listen, I need to say this before I close. This is never going to stop. Humanity, humanity, according to Genesis 6, is evil. That's what God says. Thank God for Jesus. Our lives have changed now. We are, we can be different because of Jesus Christ. We can be different because of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. We can be different because of the word of God. However, to say that it's going to stop, it's never going to stop. However, uh, if, we, if we exercise our vote, if we're educated and we, we, we are involved to the point that we're allowing policies to change, um, those persons who are in law enforcement that don't mean well are going to have to think a little bit more about their decisions because their penalties can be much greater than what they are now. The consequences for their choices can be much greater than what they are now. And it's establishing a law that's, watch this, that is just, that is impartial, that is fair. And these are laws that apply to everyone. Watch this, going back to how God originally intended and designed for it to be. Listen, my prayer is that this, just this little talk has been helpful to some degree uh, to, uh, to all of you. That's still a lot for us to talk about as it relates to this subject. Uh, still a lot of issues for us to deal with. But let's not allow this thing to just kind of go away. We've got to stay with it. We've got to be educated. Uh, we have to uh, do our part, if you will. Uh, but our strength is prayer as a church. Our strength as citizens is the vote, and it can be done, but we've got to come together to be able to get it done. Father, thank you again for your word that is so pure, your word that is so powerful, your word that does not change, your word that be becomes the direction that we need for anything that we need to do in life. And so help us again as the church of Jesus Christ universally and locally to recognize that we are part of the greatest power that exists. There's no entity in the world as powerful as the church of Jesus Christ. And so help us to be involved to the extent that we're concerned about honoring all people, loving the brotherhood, fearing God, and honoring the king. And we thank you for that reality. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Listen, until we meet again, my prayer is that God continue to bless and keep all of you. Don't forget. Uh, those of you that would, would want the, uh, the souvenir books, they are available. Uh, again, we did say $65 uh, for those of you that want them. Uh, just let us know. We can uh, mail them to you. Matter of fact, I'll deliver them to them if you want. Uh, so thank you again for your continued uh, support. Would you let others know that uh, tonight I am going to be on the conference call doing the Bible study again. For those that want to share it again, I'll be on again just to, uh, to share it with you all. Um, we're still working on them. We're still working on reopening it's not an easy decision it's not a fast decision uh, but want you to know as, as your as your church as the elders as deacons as servant leaders of your church we are working through every detail possible but always at the end of the day trust in God to give us final direction on what we are to do until we meet again God bless you I love you bye bye